Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Stashew, and I'm joined by my good friend. He is one of the hosts of the On Seagal podcast. My good friend and yours, Mr. Trevor Gumbel. Hello, hello, hello. Good to be back. And good to have you back, Trevor, because on this episode of the Culture Cast, we're going to be talking about another movie from television. This one is the first in a series that would span, oh, 25 years and result in 15 more movies. Past this one, we're taking a look at Sharp's Rifle. Yes. So Sharp's Rifle is based on the book series Sharp by Bernard Cornwell. It is written by... Uh, excuse me, actually, let me back this up. I'm on the wrong page. It is written by Yoan Harris, directed by Tom Clegg, and stars the one and only Sean Bean. And yes, we're going to be spoiling it, but ahead of time, if there's 15 more of these movies, that means Sean Bean didn't die in this movie. Holy shit. I, it's, it, is, it is shocking in and of itself that Sean Bean is still alive at the end of this movie. Wait a minute, why am I acting shocked? I watched this fucking thing. That's true. So Trevor, uh-huh. I know you had never seen this before. No. This, I don't think, made it over the pond, um, like a lot of the stuff from... It might have made it on like PBS sure. during one of their pledge drives or something, but I don't th- I've never heard of it before, before so, today. So before Trevor, now. give me your thoughts watching Sharp's Rifle for the first time. Uh, you know, full, full disclosure, I've never really gotten into like the Revolutionary War, those kind of films, uh, historical, whatever. Period pieces. Period pieces. And now, period war pieces or period pieces? Period. Well, I guess you could say both, but there, but there are exceptions to the rule. I mean, there are times where I do enjoy a good, you know, Saving Private Ryan. Of course. I mean, go watch our saving or go listen to our Saving Private Ryan episode. I think that's the first time Trevor and I not only disagreed. Oh, we hardly dis- we hard we, disagreed. We disagreed very, very, <laughs> very hard. hard. Yeah, I look. You know, um, I don't think we're going to disagree that hard on this one. Spoilers. For no, everybody. no. I mean, but I get this, it. Period pieces aren't my are not my thing either. I get. But it. Sean Bean, Sean Bean is. I love Sean Bean. He's a he's a terrific actor. Um, added bonus, you got Brian Cox. Uh, in just a fantastic performance, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, his he just he owns every scene that he's in. I I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a very um, it was kind of different because from the opening scene, it, you're gonna you you realize this is a different sort of period war piece because the musical score isn't your usual classical violins kind of score no this is electric guitar you know not to the not to the point of Hans Zimmer but it's got kind of a rocking score to it and yeah. you know I'm like wow this is uh this is different so I mean it kind of caught me off guard and that was in a good way it caught me off guard I mean I mean the way they introduced Sean Bean's character uh he's basically a badass to the whole film and kind of an asshole in, 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 in some respects. Sure. Um, his character is kind of a dick, but then again, you know, he's like the head of the soldier. So I guess he has to have some sort of authority to him. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. What about you? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I similarly to yourself, like you had mentioned, I'm not a period piece guy. I mean, for me, it's just, it's not my thing. I don't know what it is. I don't think it's any one thing specifically. Yeah. But for me, Period pieces just don't do it for me. I mean, I know for like a decade there, I mean, even up until last five years, you were having these Elizabeth II movies or Queen Victoria. And it's like, yeah, it was a Jane Austen a thon. Yeah, I could not be bothered to watch those movies because it's just not my thing. Not Mm -hmm. saying I wouldn't enjoy it if I watched it. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's just not something that motivates me. So that out of the way, Andrew one of our Patreon supporters. He's the one who programmed this month. And this was on his list. He had mentioned oh. this to me countless times to, <laughs> to check it out. And, and not that I had to, you know, be him to be a Patreon supporter to watch. Yeah. It. I've watched plenty of stuff that Andrew suggested, but mm-hmm. this is one of those things where he was like, you need to check this out. And so I want this to be part of the month. Mm-hmm. And I see why now, because I will tell you while I've seen Sean Bean in a lot of stuff, and we'll talk about Sean Bean probably more than anything else on this episode. Uh I've seen Sean Bean in a lot of amazing stuff. So have you. I mean, Goldeneye, Lord of the the Rings, uh, Silent Hill, Uh The Martian. I mean, he doesn't do a lot in some of these movies. 
National Treasure. He's the villain in the first National Treasure movie. And he's a great villain. Uh, Patriot Games. Yes. Um, he's in a lot. I mean, look, he, you know, the, he, he actually isn't terrible in that Hitcher remake. It's not that Hitcher remake's not good. And that has nothing to do with him. I haven't seen it. Does he play the Hitcher? The he, play, he plays the Rutger. The Rutger Hauer. Yeah. yeah. He's great. I mean, he's great in it. He's yeah. good. The movie's not great, but he's pretty good. But I love Sean Bean as much as I think a, a lot of folks who grew up in the 90s love him for Goldeneye, for Lord of the Rings. So, you know, but there is this kind of assumption now that because of something like Game of Thrones, uh-huh. which is kind of the thing I didn't want to mention, given how bad that show is. Um, he's great in, I mean, he's the best part of Game of Thrones in that first season. Yeah, except they kill him off. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. But that's, you know, that's kind of the, On the, a, big, the big shocker of that first season. So. I'm going to say this about Game of Thrones, and this is the only thing I say about Game of Thrones. I tried watching it. I tried getting into it. But every time I watched it, I felt like I was doing a homework assignment. Well, because it, it, seemed, it didn't reward the viewers at the end. So, well, it seemed like everybody was hyping the show up as like, oh my God, this is one of the greatest shows that has ever aired on television. And I watched it. I'm like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's okay. It's not terrible, but I'm not seeing the fandom here. I mean, the best thing about that show is Peter Dinklage because I love Peter Dinklage. Um, the, show, the show has its moments, but the problem with the show overall is you have people involved with the show who make the show that were not making the show in good faith towards the end. Uh-huh. They started giving up on making the show at a hundred percent. And so the show fell apart. And then the final seasons, the show just goes completely off the rails. Yeah. It's it's the show is unequivocally awful at the end. And if that riles some people up, that's my opinion. I'm sticking. To well, it. I've heard the legend, the, the, the last season as, as, and the finale in, in particular is a legendary clusterfuck. Yeah, that's really bad. It's really, it is as bad as you have heard. All of that notwithstanding. We've gotten great actors coming out of that now starting to be in more mainstream stuff. Yeah. I mean, we had Jason Momoa, who's Aquaman. We had Amelia Clark, who's, Can you we know. not include Jason Momoa in that list? Because I don't like Jason Momoa. Okay, fine. Okay, not Jason I don't Momoa. think he's a talented actor. I think he does one thing really well, which is fine. But that does not make you a good actor. That makes you a talented character actor. Okay. If, if if that, I'm not even sure. I actually, you know what? I will go as far as to say that Jason Momoa is not as talented as most character actors. He's just a good looking guy. Okay. Then moving on, Amelia Clark. She's yeah, she's, she's a very good actress. Richard. Madden. Um, I I will give you this. I will give the show this. It had one of the biggest, greatest bastards in television history with Joffrey. Yeah. I mean, nobody else wanted that son of a bitch dead more than me. Well, I'm like, and the rest of the fan base. Everybody wanted that motherfucker dead. <laughs> and, but I, I mean, again, yeah. the, the show has the show has a really well done, polished feel to it that a lot of shows don't have. And it also ha- was a big budget fantasy show, which it, essentially didn't exist before that show. It was an epic show. Yeah, it's it's epic in its scope. Yeah, that doesn't excuse every misstep that they kept making over and over again. But all that I out agree. of the way. All that out of all the way. All out of the way. Let's, this, Sean we Bean were... is an amazing actor. Yes. Period. period. Uh-huh. I love Sean Bean. So do you. He Absolutely. is the best part about this. He will be the reason. He will be the reason I watch any more of these. Because yeah. I will tell you, there have been few and far between things that I have seen that have cast Sean Bean in the lead role. True. He's mostly like, the, the side character and and the villain. Yeah. Um, Patriot National Games. National like Treasure. It, like you said, GoldenEye, Patriot Games, National Treasure. But the thing with Sean Bean is he has a versatility to play a hero and a villain. But unfortunately, he's mostly been used for a villain. Right. Almost exclusively. Almost exclusively. So it's kind of refreshing to see him in a heroic role like this. It's yeah. nice to see him, you know, but he still plays the role kind of villainy. Like, He's kind of a jerk. Yeah, I mean, I don't think in a way. way to remove. I don't think there's any way to remove Sean Bean from the role because, like, like you said, Sean Bean just brings this like energy to a role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I think that energy is just it's that is part of who he is. Yeah, that's just Sean Bean, I guess. Yeah, no, I yeah, mean, I, I agree. That's 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 a very minor minor criticism about the film. Um, I mean, other than that, it's. 
Uh, I mean, the supporting cast is is great. Brian Cox playing. <sighs> Let's just get some... this out of the way. There aren't very many people in this other than like recognizable. Are, no, there's not very no. many people other than Sean Bean and and. I mean, there may be if you watch a lot of British television, there may be some recognizable faces in there. But unfortunately, the British, my British television is more in the comedy, like sure. IT crowd, space, Red Dwarf, that kind of stuff. Sure. I didn't recognize other than Brian Cox and and Sean Bean. Um, it would be like someone from the UK watching a television series of ours uh-huh. and not picking up on certain character actors. That's essentially what it feels like, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, um, that's of course. Yeah. This movie is set in Spain with a a troop of British fighting soldiers who are um, going through Spain and they are trying to, I guess, liberate the, Spain? Um, well, okay. From the, the mission. Well, okay. Let's back up a little bit. We first meet Sharp um, as a, a regular soldier, I think. Yeah. And as a sergeant, he manages to take down these French ambushers. And in doing so, he gets promoted to lieutenant to lieutenant. And he is sent and his assignment is to find originally his assignment is to find uh, this man named Rothschild. Yep. Because he is supposed to that Rothschild. We're not going to get into any Illuminati I know, conversations. But it, but, it, but it is that Rothschild. Yes, but we're ending that there. No Correct. Illuminati bullshit Correct. here. And apparently he... It's unfortunate is, that that shit got co-opted, unfortunately. Unfortunately. The Rothschild family is just a family of people, like a very rich family. Like that's... And, <laughs> read that as rich family. I, I don't know what exactly. else to say. Uh, should we just change it to rich family instead of Rothschild then? I mean, it, it's just weird. Like of all the things to mention, like... Yeah. Well, okay. So they go... He sends him to find this man named Rothschild because they need to be paid. Right. Because they are way, way behind on their payments. So he is sent on the mission to find Rothschild. And along the way, uh, he meets his crew. Um, uh, what is their nickname again? The Chosen Men. The Chosen Men. That's what I thought. And they're, they're, um, supposedly they're like the, the finest sharpshooters that the British Army has. They make a point later on where it's like... If you, you know, if you're shooting, if you have three bullets, there should be three dead people. It's mm-hmm. that, it's that kind of like hyper militant. These guys exist because they are the prime sharpshooters. They can kill a guy from a hundred yards away before he mm-hmm. even sees them type thing. And they are the definition of like ragtag group. Right. Um, they're like <laughs> the bad news bears of the, of the, of, you know, assassins or something like that. Yeah. Um, my favorite of which is the Irishman. Oh, the, oh yeah, yeah, Harper. Harper. Yeah. Um, I loved Harper. I thought he was. Yeah, I, I, he's a great character. Yeah. Um, a great a great scene in the film is when he first meets the uh, the the cavalry and he notices that one guy has a bottle of liquor in his pocket and <laughs> he tells him to uh, destroy the liquor bottle and one of the guys says, "Good lord, they've given us a Methodist." Yeah. Good I mean, Lord, he's the method. Then he ends up like downing the whole thing. I mean, Sharp is Sharp is a character that we have seen before. Mm-hmm. He is, like you mentioned, he's a little rough around the edges. Mm-hmm. But you know, like once you're introduced to this character, you know where this is going. Exactly. Like, this is very much again. This is the first of fifteen or sixteen. So this yeah. is the first story. It's very much boilerplate. It's a it's a man learning how to be a leader. It's a, mm-hmm. it's it's a it's, you know it's a guy it's a guy who's not a leader becoming a leader rising to the occasion and helping uh you know these mm-hmm. local these local I guess militia these Spanish yeah. guerrillas he's helping them overturn and push back the French and that's yes. that's essentially um, the first half of the movie is like them kind of traversing the landscape mm-hmm. and the second half it's them excising these French invaders out of the land and trying to raise the banner of blood over this this little well town. well it, it um well first the troop has to meet up with the other part of the army right who apparently don't respect them they tell them uh they'll you know they're uh, one of their um orders is to traverse up the hill so he has that so he has sharp and his men do it before they do to tell them what the terrain is like which is fortunate because while they're on that hill the french ambush the rest of the army and basically kill, kill them all yeah. Kill all of them. 
And Sharp sees this, and who else sees it are two Spaniards who Spanish notice that guerrilla leaders, Spanish guerrilla leaders who notice that Sharp and his men aren't in that, and they're just sitting there watching it. So they're like they're thinking like, okay, he's our man. We need right. him for our mission. So um, they meet up with them not long afterwards. The woman says, "We need you're going in that direction. Can you take us with you anyway?" Right. Um, it's and they're carrying. It's a mutual thing, right? Because yeah, it's a mutual thing. And they're carrying this this trunk with something in it, but they will not say what it is. Only that it needs to be protected. They claim it has important government documents. In it. It, yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's get this out of the way. The French are just bastards. They're portrayed pretty poorly. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> really, it's, 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 it's not the most glowing, uh, portrayal of the French, especially the, of course it's the henchman that you hate the most and not the main, the main French guy. It's the henchman that you don't like. Well, and at one point, uh, one of the French colonels is just going to shoot sharp point blank mm-hmm. and, and sharp is unarmed. Obviously, that doesn't happen, but, um, you know. Yeah. Frankly, yeah, this... The French portrayal is, is real bad. But, I mean, again, it, I, I, like, this is not a not exactly a positive point in history for anything going no, on. No, and it, believe me, if this wasn't 1993, there'd be people up in arms right now about this, I think. Um, but, yeah, the... the Let's talk about the, the fighting in the film, the battle scenes, which are <laughs> relatively... I mean, this is a made-for-TV film, so of course it probably is. It's relatively low in bloodshed. I mean, you see a guy, you'll see him get sliced, and then he moves to the side and falls down dead. So, I mean, I, I maybe not more, maybe not not the most realistic portrayal of of what a sword would do to a person back then. But well, I mean, again, I dramatic. think that there's there's some limitations here uh, yeah. of what's going on. So I didn't know. Not that I didn't know when this was set, but to give the audience an idea of the time period that this essentially entire series is set. Uh This entire series is set between 1807 and 1814 during the Peninsular Wars, which was a military conflict between the French, or excuse me, the United Kingdom, the Spanish, and Portugal. Uh And they were fighting against the French for the control of the Iberian Peninsula. And this is during the time of Napoleon, obviously they mentioned Napoleon in this movie uh-huh. a couple times. But just to give the audience an idea of when this is going on, this is going on in the early 1800s. Yes. So this um, is really farther back than probably, like, I assume that this was, like, late 1800s when I was yeah. first sitting down to watch it. But this yeah. is, like, muskets. This is, like, muskets and black powder. Like, no repeating rifles here. Like, that's yeah. why they make the big deal out of, like, you know, when you shoot your bullet, you need to hit your shot because you're not going to have a lot of time to reload your gun. Or about the, they make a big deal out of not being half cocked, as they say. Right. Um, there's a great scene uh, where the French have set a trap for Sharp and his men by setting the Spaniards town on fire. Right. Leaving everyone dead so that they will leave their horses and leave the, the trunk unattended so they could get it. And the only one they leave they leave there to guard it are a couple Spaniards and I forgot his name again the the Irish guy oh um, Harper who has been um, I I don't know if you could say arrested or what but he basically no he hit he hits Sharp and that puts him under arrest yeah for what Sharp he did. essentially calls him a mutineer yeah a mutineer for fighting with him at the at the at the beginning when they first meet and there's a scene where while they're in the town surveying the damage um we'll get back to that in a second because we meet a couple other people we'll we'll get to them um the henchman of the frenchman nope no didn't mean to rhyme that um offers him a purse of 100 gold pieces to switch sides right and you would think in a lesser film you would think huh he's already hit the sharp we don't he's already not shown himself to be a good guy maybe that you know he'll turn he doesn't turn right in fact, he shoots the two guards that are with him and then tries to shoot him, but only gets his hat. And that and goes. And then Sean Bean promotes him. Yeah. Even though he looks like he's going to um, chastise him for being half cocked with his rifle. Um, but that was that was a good scene. But um, while they're at the uh, burning uh, Spanish town scene, they meet two, uh, a, a lovely couple of Methodist um I don't know. What are they? Uh, parishioners, missionaries. missionaries. Um, 
I put in air quotes Methodist missionaries because we'll get to that in a minute. Um, There's an interesting choice that this movie makes that I'm not sure is it's just weird. Well, well they, we meet them and then they, you know, they they um, take a, a, a carriage with them. And while in the carriage, Sean Bean pretends to sleep and notices that they started smoking and speaking. What was it? French they were speaking or Spanish? Something like that. Yeah. He catches them speaking a, a foreign language. So he knows something's up with these people. Um, but it's not really mentioned until the very end of the film. And then it's no, no. And then it well, turns out one of the characters is a character no, no, no. In, uh, in drag. Well, I mean, if you see this person, you'll know, you'll yeah. know this, you'll know it is not a, it's not a woman. And I was, it's as I was watching presented to us, it's while it might be presented to us as a female character, it is very obviously a not. male, a male character dressed. And, up. That, and I was, I was watching the film. Like if this is actually a female, that is the most, yeah, I and I felt bad for thinking that because I'm like, oh my God, I'm an asshole for thinking this. That is. <laughs> but it turns out that it is not a female character. Yeah. And we'll get to that at the, at the end. Um, so uh, am I recapping this too much? Uh, a little, but that's okay. Be- there's a, I mean, look, the problem with this is there's a lot of shit that goes on in this movie. Uh huh. It's a so hundred, much so, it's a hundred minutes long and it, uh-huh. it uses it packs all, it. Yeah. It, it, it packs uses it. all 100 minutes. And when it gets to the end, you're just like, Thank okay, you. here we go. It's know. it's the you know the story ends and it's like well, the next one picks up right after it. Clearly, like and the 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 fact that it's so smashed is is brings me to one of my criticisms of the film is that they set up the Spanish woman um, to be a love interest for Sean Bean, but I didn't feel any chemistry with them. No, but she is in the she is in the next one though. That's kind of the weird thing about this, right? Is like. Yeah. Some of my criticism is similar to yours in that it's like, well, it didn't do this or it didn't do that. But then I have to sit here and say like, okay, I've done my research. I know that she shows up again in the next movie. And I think she shows up in the movie after that one as well. Yeah. So <sighs> she she shows up in a lot of these. So I think she's a, a big part. She's at least in the next three. And then, and then in the fifth one, you know who they cast? Liz who? Hurley. Really? As the same woman? As a as another female love interest for sure. Oh, <sighs> I mean, I mean that's a nineties. It's the nineties in the UK. <laughs> like, well, who was a I mean, bigger female actress in the nineties in the UK than Liz Hurley? Not very many people. No, nah, not really. Um, I mean, she was a supermodel back then. I mean, she was like mm-hmm. it. Yeah. She was big in America too. So, um, but like I said, I mean. That's all well and good that they do it better in the next films they set it up. But this is a film I'm watching right now. No, I, I agree. I agree. I want they should set it up in the first moment. Don't wait till the second film to set up to make the believable chemistry. I mean, okay, in the first film, it's fine. You want to set it up as they do fall in love eventually, but no, they get right into him wanting to have sex with her. Well, they're making love by the end of the movie. Yeah, and I do not buy the chemistry. I'm with you. I'm actually with you 100%. I mean, again, it's it's kind of like a lot of things that we're watching now, where it's like this, this movie, in a lot of ways, stands on its own. But at the same time, it, it yeah. doesn't. It feels very much like, okay, we have a, an attractive hero figure, and we have a pretty woman in the film. Uh, well, it's it's like they have to follow a law that they have to get together at the end if they have an attractive woman and an attractive female uh, male lead, who's the hero. Yeah. Very rarely do they ever break that rule in Hollywood. No. And I mean, they, they break it more now, but in, in my mind here, it would have been better just to leave it out. But look, I haven't read the books. Me neither. I, I'm going to assume probably correctly that this character is a major part in the books, which it is. This character is in, is in the books. So there you go. I, I agree. I mean, I think that, but you know, like I said, in the here and now, we're not watching the second film. We're not reading the books right now. We're watching the film. I know. I think that gets lost a lot now, Trevor. I think it's an unfortunate thing. I think that the way you're phrasing it is, is something that people really should put more stock into this idea of like, I'm sitting and watching this movie now. It should be its own. It it should be able to stand on its own. Uh-huh. As a as a building construct, you know, like if a, if a movie is a building under construction, 
you see the foundation being laid. And then by the end of the movie, you have a building that you can walk around. Yeah. It uh-huh. should not need to be propped up by other things. Like, you know, talking to, we I was talking about this recently. The you remember where they announced that Emperor Palpatine was coming back in the last in the Rise of Skywalker? Do you remember that shit? Unfortunately. Yeah, it was it was announced in fucking Fortnite. Like Oh yeah. Yeah, I remember like, that. Like to me it's like there are going to be people that don't do anything with Fortnite that aren't gonna know that. And then they're gonna yeah. wonder about this this broadcast that you, they talk about at the beginning of the rise of Skywalker and they never talk about it because it was in Fortnite in, in movies like this or in anything we watch in general, if you can't make something for me that I can sit and watch Uh and appreciate on its own as a singular idea without anything else, Uh you maybe need to readdress what you're doing because there was a time where there was no streaming. There was no, TV tie-ins to your movies are comic book tie-ins. Uh-huh. And people made movies that just lived as a movie. I mean, the original Star Wars was just a movie for 20 years or 10 years before they re, you know, before they re-went in and did all the nonsense by adding prequels and sequels. Star Wars was just its own thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, Lucas originally planned for the first three films. Right. But he didn't really, I don't think he he might have had ideas for the other film, but he never mentioned them. And even if he did, those weren't the ideas that were used in this latest trilogy. No, the prequels are the movies that Lucas wanted to make. Exactly. For good or for bad, they are the movies Lucas wanted to make. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's, 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 (sighs) that's one of the pain in the asses of adapting books to film. Oh yeah. Especially if it's a series of books. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, film studios are smart enough to know that people will assume they have to see this one before they see this one. So they'll see this one before, you know, they'll they'll watch the, it's like with the Harry Potter franchise, they know that this isn't going to be the only film in the franchise. They know they're going to be other Harry Potter films. So they prepare themselves that and they see the first film, unless they're not interested whatsoever. They see the first film. They don't, you know, Yeah. so it's not, so it's not like they're asking too much of them in that respect. Same goes with the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. You it's know, an expectation. it's an expectation because, you know, it's a trilogy. You know, he made, you know, he made the three books, the fellowship, the two towers, return of the king. So there's no surprises there. So they know if they don't watch the first one, they're shit out of luck with the second and the third one. You know what I mean? Right. It is not the creator's fault that you watched the second movie of Lord of the Rings and didn't know what was going on. If mm-hmm. you chose not to watch the first one. Yeah. In Sharp's Rifle, the fact that they've left stuff out, I appreciate it was probably for the sake of the, you know, the time of the movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the movie could have used another 20 minutes. Yeah, they could have made it a hundred minutes. Like it, they could have made it a solid two hours. Yeah. I, I honestly think it would have benefited from a little bit more chemistry building between Sharp and mm-hmm. uh Moreno, Teresa Moreno, the the character, mm-hmm. the, the female Spanish character. I would have frankly enjoyed seeing more of Sharp around kind of the bureaucracy of the the British army. I mean, you Mm -hmm. see it a little bit with Brian Cox's character, but you're not, you know, you're not really given. Brian Cox is not that exactly in it for terribly long. In it for like two scenes. Yeah. And they laid up, they, they, you know, measure up to like five minutes, if that. Yeah. But he makes an impression. So that, that, that says a lot to Brian Cox. Um, I feel that the revelation of what's in the trunk to the finale is extremely rushed. Yeah. Um, they first tell him, well, what's in this trunk is a bloodied Spanish flag that if we raise up in this Spanish town, it will inspire the others to fight against the French and we will make an impact. Right. And Sean Bean is immediately skeptical. He's like, this is just silly superstition. I'm not going to go all the way and risk our lives for the flag, but his turnaround is way too damn quick for me. It's like, I'm not going to leave the superstition two minutes later. Okay, let's go. They go to the town and it's resolved really quickly, a little too quickly rushed for my taste. Yeah, no, I, I agree that the, it seems like the movie front loads most of what's going on. And then the, the, when they get to the city of Taurus, Toracostro, mm-hmm. it kind of, it just rushes. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, here's the finale of the movie. And look again, I, I, I like the finale of the film. I like the kind of the battle scene in Torre Castro. Mm-hmm. I just wanted more of it, which, yeah. but yeah. I mean, again, you, 
I don't know why it's 100 minutes as opposed to 120, because unless it was just airing, it aired on ITV in 93. Uh-huh. I'm not going to sit here and complain about the movie not being long enough because there are literally 15 more of these fucking movies that I could go and watch. But yeah. for this first one, as an introduction to the character of Richard Sharp, I think it does a good enough job for the most part. Now, Trevor, my yeah. question to you is, is this good enough for you to go watch the next one? Would you would you I will I will to us sitting down, opening up some beers and putting on the next Sharps movie. Sharps Eagle. Because that's the test of this, right? It's really not something I would rush to see. The, I wasn't thinking to myself after I watched, I'm like, oh my God, I have to complete the series now. I have to watch this whole thing. It didn't grab me that much, but I will not say that I'll never watch subsequent films um, because maybe one day I'll be in the mood to, to, to see how this, how this progresses. So, I mean, I guess I would interested in watching the, and, and the other films because, and hopefully they're better paced and better. I mean, story structured, uh, I would assume so, given that they made these from 93 to 2008. I mean, that's yeah. that's a I look, that's a long time. I mean, Sean Bean was making this series through not only him being in Goldeneye, but also him being in Lord of the Rings, almost up until the moment he's in Game of Thrones. I mean, Game of Thrones premiered in what, uh, 2010? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And this is 2008? I mean, this is... For all intents and purposes, this is Sean Bean's. This is his role. Bernard Cornwell, the guy who wrote the books. Yeah. He changed the Sharp character to closer fit Sean Bean. He gave the Sharp character a backstory in Yorkshire, where Sean Bean is from. And he also stopped mentioning in the books that Sharp had dark hair. Because Sharp in the books has dark black hair. And Uh Sean Bean does not have dark black hair. And that is a testament to Sean Bean. It it that if that if that is not, I don't know what is. That is a testament to him taking that character. I mean, look, it, it's like it's like with Jack Reacher, right? Did Tom mm-hmm. Cruise do enough with Jack Reacher to make that character his own? No, because they recast him. And it's not because he was short or any mm-hmm. of that other shit. Like, just because your character looks or sounds a certain way in the book doesn't necessarily mean an actor and a director and a writer couldn't come in and cast someone who breaks that mold. Yeah. But they have to do a really good job at giving you a reason why they're in it because otherwise people are just going to go, see, I told you so. Exactly. I mean, everyone said Tom Cruise is too short to play Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher is a physically intimidating character in the books. Jack Reacher comes out. Tom Cruise is good, but he doesn't, light up the screen he doesn't burn down you know the the movie uh you know the movie financials he's not you know top movie of all time it's moderately successful they make a sequel it's not as good but he Mm -hmm. didn't make the character his own no um i only saw the first jack reacher film and my takeaway was it's fine yeah it's just okay it's okay i mean that's nothing against tom cruise none whatsoever i mean i've seen him in films where he is charming as hell Right. I mean, a film, I, a film I thought was underrated with Tom Cruise, where I thought he was actually very funny, was Night and Day, the film with him and Cameron Diaz. Um, I actually pretty, thought pretty far off of my radar. Let's put it that way. Uh, well, I thought it was charming. I thought it was funny. I, you know, I, you're the only person I've ever heard say it was good. And that not because I know a bunch of people who said it was bad. I, you're the first person I've ever heard have anything to say about that movie. So I saw it. I saw it in the theater. Because I was taking, I was going with my sister because she was seeing the new Twilight film with my cousin Rachel. And I thought, well, what am I going to do to kill time? And there's really nothing else I wanted to see there. Go see and I thought, Twilight. like I said, there's really nothing else I wanted to see there. And then I thought, you know what? You know what? Fuck it. Night and day. Let's, I'll just go see night. It'll be it. If I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's a which, time killer. Which Twilight movie was it? God, when did night and day come out? Um, was it Breaking Dawn? No, I think it was either New Moon or Eclipse. Have you seen all those movies? No, I've I seen. Have. I watched the first one with my sister, and I promised her I would not laugh at it, and I broke that promise within five minutes. That can't be true. It's not that bad in the first five minutes. No, I just that- I just watched these movies. They're not that bad. They're bad, but I've seen way worse. Like they're bad in a way the that like best, I expected them to be bad. You know, the best thing to happen. The best thing to happen to Twilight is Fifty Shades of Grey. Because no, now that's, there's that's the worst thing to happen. To no, no, no. It's the best thing to happen to Twilight because now 
I don't think of Twilight so lowly now. Now I think the bottom. Oh, I see what is, you're getting. The at. bottom is Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a piece of shit, and the author's a piece of shit. Put yeah. that on the fucking record. E.L. Gray is not a good person. And E.L. Gray also ripped off Twilight. I mean, E.L. E. James. E.L. James. Oh, sure. Whatever the fuck. She basically, is. that's what pisses me off about the whole thing, is she basically rips off Twilight, changes a few things, calls it Fifty Shades of Grey, sells millions of copies, and then has the balls to demand rewrites on the film and a director change on the film. Fuck you, lady. I mean, fuck you. I mean, I don't blame her. She. Whether or not it's a Twilight fan fiction, it is still massively successful, and they are going to kowtow to whatever the person who made it successful wants. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm not defending it. I get it. Like, I read Fifty Shades of Grey, man. Like, I read the first one. It is it is one of the worst things I have ever read. It is written by someone whose grasp of the English language is tenuous at best. It gives Seattle a bad name. I mean, does Twilight give it a good name? You know, my sister and her husband went to Forks on their honeymoon. Dude, Twilight was a thing for a lot of people. Yeah. That's not surprising. Look, I, for me, there's a lot of these. I get it. I get it. I get it like I get Harry Potter. Like, I get what the appeal is. I mean, I get the appeal of Twilight. I mean, and I guess the appeal of Fifty Shades of Grey is like horny housewives need a little. Horny housewives reading something. That's kinkier than a Harlequin romance novel, but still not. And I love not quote unquote pornography. And I love how the the kink community has railed against Fifty Shades of Grey as yeah, making it's not their real. It makes them look bad. Well, yeah, because all the things that E.L. James talks about in those books is like someone reading about it on the internet, and that's how they understand it. You don't understand the kink community by reading about it on. That's one of the worst things about the film is he has no idea what the hell she's talking about. Or the books, I mean. What? Oh, Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah. We should just do Fifty Shades of Grey Twilight Month. <sighs> I will sacrifice forever. my eyes for you. I've seen all the Twilight movies, and I've seen the first two Fifty Shades of Grey movies. Those Fifty Shades of Grey movies are really bad. Chris, I love you, I and I love this podcast. I know. I will sit through them. What? For all this podcast. If you ask it of me, I will sit through all of them for you, for this podcast, because I love this podcast Don't so much. Put yourself in that spot. I will take you up on it. I will make you watch all the Twilight movies and then all the Fifty Shades of Grey movies, and we can contrast and compare each one. We will do that, but you need to be careful putting that out, that energy out of the universe, because I am a man of my word, my friend. You know so, that. Okay, I did so all eight Saw movies in one podcast. So hold on. Hold on. Would we be doing each film a podcast or all the films in one podcast? See, I don't get to give you that answer now. See, see, it'd that's be not, fine. That's not part of this agreement here. Okay, no, you no, no. You no. said you would talk about them. I will talk about them. And you if they're them space- separately, I'm not fucking insane anymore. Okay, I want good. to do a seven hour podcast. I've done it. I mean, look, one of the first episodes of the projection booth I ever listened to was the Conan episode. That episode is literally eight and a half hours long. Uh-huh. Go listen to it. If you've never listened to it, it is an undertaking. Our friend Mike is the podcasting man. 100%. Uh-huh. The fact that he's willing to do that is crazy. But you know what? We also have on this show several episodes of this show where if I was able to upload them in their entirety, they would be the same length. We did that for Turtles. We did it for Jurassic Park. We did it for the Hannibal series. And we did it for the Saw movies, at least the ones that were out at the time. Uh-huh. I mean, we covered all the Saw movies in one episode. That's like eight fucking hours because we had interviews and everything else. I'm a sadist, man. What can I tell you? I hear you. I mean, it all done at once. I hear you. Oh, God. There is a small, tiny part of me that wants to just test my limits. Those movies aren't that bad. Like, I'm talking about the 50 50 Shades films, not the Twilight films. Yeah, but they're still not really that bad. They're bad in like a. I can't believe a major studio is putting money behind this shit way. Three of them. Yeah. But well, I mean, again, immensely successful books, immensely successful movies. I mean, that's the, the thing about 50 shades of gray is similar to Harry Potter. Like there's no way those movies weren't successful. No, I they mean, just have to be it's a middle built, of the road to be successful. It's a built in fan base. Yeah. It's like, with a lot of Remember when, uh, when twilight hit, the studios bought up every young adult, teen, sci-fi, whatever genre they could and made them into films. 
And those films weren't always successful. No, nope. Divergent. Um, um, but they still, well, Divergent wasn't terribly successful, but they still kept at it for like three movies. Maze Runner. Uh, the Maze Runner. Uh, Percy Jackson. Hunger Games. Uh, the, what was it? The City of Ember. Did Hunger uh, Games just kind of like happen and go away? I can't tell you because I enjoyed the films. I enjoyed them oh, a lot. I, oh. And the books are good too. I like the books. Not my cup of tea, and I really don't find Jennifer Lawrence to be as appealing as an actress as so many people do. The, cons- the, the whole, like, oh, shucks, yuck, yuck thing seems like a, a, a thinly veiled smokescreen at being conceited. I'm like you guys. No, you're not. Don't pretend. You ever seen you- Ariana? I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You ever see Ariana Grande's impression of her on SNL? No. It is dead on. Is it? Yeah, she's fake. A- she's fucking fake. Like, I'm sorry, but Jennifer Lawrence is fake. That is a put on. I, I. Come on. I, no, you know it's I, true. Mm, no, not we gonna all say do. It. We all know it's true. We all just buy into it because it's much easier to believe that the actors we like are nice rather than, you know, complex human beings like you and I. So anyway, back to Sharp's rifle. <laughs> um, Deflection, Trevor. <laughs> yeah. Look, this is an adaptation of a book series, an uh-huh. immensely successful book series. Very, yeah. A There's book 20, series I've never 20, heard of until. 24 books. That's yeah. a lot. That's a lot of books. That's a lot of writing. That's your a move, lot of... Jar Jar R. Martin. <laughs> I, well, you'll be waiting until you're blue in the face. Yeah. Um, but, I, I, you know, as, as book adaptations go, having uh-huh. not read the book, does this make me want to read the book? It doesn't not want me make me want to read the book, if that makes sense. I'm not sure that this kind of literature is my cup of tea is probably the bigger. Yeah, that's that's my that's my that's my viewpoint. Exactly. It's like, I'm not sure if I makes me want to read the books, but, you know, I'll ch- I might check out the, the next film. Sure. I would know um, what I'm getting myself into if I read yeah. the books. Let's put it that yeah. way. Um, no, I, I, I enjoyed this. The, huh. the question I asked you, my answer is an unequivocal. Yes, I would watch. I would watch more of this. OK. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think it's I think it's perfectly I think it's perfectly suitable for what the audience at the time was probably expecting. And I think mm-hmm. look, Sean Bean Sean Bean is clearly the best part of this movie. I mean oh, the by reason, any- yeah, Bernard Cornwell doesn't take his character and meld it into a uh, you know, an amalgamation of the original character and Sean Bean, you know, for no reason. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not a that's not a just a happy coincidence. Mm-hmm. And uh, we didn't talk about the twist at the end, did we? Oh, not 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 straight up. I'm not even sure if I want um, to talk about it. We we spoke briefly a minute ago about how the Methodist couple, the female of it, didn't look particularly female. We find out at the end that the female was actually Rothschild in disguise, which is why when they're having dinner in one scene, they didn't eat any of the pork, right, or stuff like that. So, I mean, I don't know how well that twist would go over today. Um, I mean, look, it's not being presented in an offensive way. No, not at all. It's just being being presented in a very matter-of-fact way. Yeah, it's a very humorous way. Because I remember thinking to myself, um, are we ever going to see what happened with the Rothschild and the money? Oh, then Sean Bean says, he's right here in this room, sir. And then takes off the wig, and that's Rothschild. I think ultimately, with something like this, with something that's a TV movie from 1993 uh-huh. based on a book from five years earlier. I, I look at this movie as a very interesting point in time because for me, this movie is also really well made for the time that it came out. And it has really interesting production value because while, yeah, not a lot happens, maybe it's a little oddly paced. It, it still looks really nice. It still looks well made. Yeah, competently, shot. competently made more than competently made. Like you mentioned, the score is fantastic. I think it's, I think for me, is it a little disappointing that there are certain things that are left out that shouldn't have been left out? Mm-hmm. Like some more character development between our lead and the kind of the female character that he's supposed to have a love interest. Is that disappointing? Yeah. But you know, again, the fact that this is good, looks good was good enough to warrant, you know, 15 more. Yeah. It must have done something right. And I enjoyed it. Yeah. I think this is, uh, along with everything else this month, I have really enjoyed dipping my toe into TV movies because 
I don't know about you, but did this feel like a TV movie to you? It kind of did. I mean, there was a, there was a, a uh, maybe it was the fact that it was, it was portrayed as such at the beginning of the credits, you know, that sure. it's a BBC production, shit like that. Um, I mean, it looks like a typical, how a typical BBC show is shot. Right. Um, Which is not to say bad. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, but it does have it that look and feel. Exactly. Um, I mean, it went on for 14 more films. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it, you know, it, it looked like a TV film, but that's not a, that's not a criticism. Not at all. Um, it is a TV film. <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, it's a, let's, let me ask you a question. Do you think this would have been successful if it was released theatrically? I think if it was released theatrically, they wouldn't have been able to serialize it as much as they did. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's pretty it, it, obviously given that there are four, you know, 15 more of these books. Mm-hmm. Um, I would assume that this would be rather serialized, which it is. It is pretty serialized. It would have gone into like bond territory. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, to me, from what I can tell reading about the sharp character, the sharp character has kind of that man on a mission feel to it, where it's mm-hmm. like this guy is just going and doing this one thing throughout each book and he's being tasked with a certain task and all these things get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I I don't think it would have succeeded as a movie. No, because, because I think it's not long enough. No. um, If they had made this like a three hour epic film, maybe. Yeah. But I don't know if this story is epic in scope. Again, we haven't watched the rest. Yeah. So I can't comment on where those plots go, but this yeah. first one is not big enough in scope. The thing I did appreciate ultimately about this is the stakes are rather low. All they have to do is take this town back. That's it. Tori Castro. That's it. And they're not saving the world. That's it. They have to take the town back and they have to bring back this banker. Yeah, that's it. Um, they're not saving the world or the planet. They're not defeating an entire army like oh. end game or something like that. It's just, it's not sharp versus Napoleon. Like this is exactly, this is small in scale, which I appreciate. I just appreciate these stories of like things that happen during the war. I mean, you know, for all of the shit that I was giving something like saving private Ryan, which I did give it a lot of shit. No, it, it deserved it. Uh, I know my opinion, not yours. You try to it, trigger me, my friend. It, it is. It is similarly to sharps rifle, small mm-hmm. in scope. You know, yes, does it open in Normandy? Sure. But is Normandy the the entire focus of the film? No. no. It is a small-scale story about a small-scale conflict between a gr- two giant groups, but this is the micro-conflict. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think ultimately with something like this, that's why I enjoyed it the most, is it just, it, it kind of knows what it is, it knows what it needs to do, and I think it executes in most categories pretty well. Yeah, and it's not, I agree. it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like because it's on TV, they had to make concessions that get in the way of my enjoyment. And that I think for a lot of people is the reason that people don't watch television movies is a lot of the ones that they've watched, they feel cheap. They don't feel like they've spent the, the requisite time and effort to make it quality. And I think that that comes with the territory too. I mean, you assume it's on TV, so it must not be as good as a movie. Yeah, except for the fact that now you watch stuff like Game of Thrones, which is literally movie quality. Mm-hmm. Higher I budget mean, than a lot of movies that even come out today. There's there's a part of me that kind of misses the cheapy TV movies of my youth. Um, of there's like when I was charming about them. There's a charming like um, I know you didn't cover these films, but like especially when they were trying to to tar- target the teen demographic back then. We had like stuff like Dance Till Dawn. They had uh, Camp Cucamonga. They had, uh, what was it called? The one about the kids who want to get their driver's license. And they all starred like TV actors, TV stars from the film. Um, But no, I thought, you know, I thought they had charm to them. I thought these, you know, even the melodramatic NBC movie of the week based on a true story kind of things had charm to them. What's your favorite TV movie? My favorite TV movie? Oh, God. Um, Being that I'm a sucker for the 80s, and you're a child of the eighties, my friend. You Charlie, are the ch- you are my friend who is a child of the eighties more and than 90s. anyone else. Yeah, I know. You're like that tweener. I I brought up Dance Till Dawn. Um, 
because it is so 80s it's just beautiful how 80s it's so it is. 80s it hurts do you know who's in that film Mm-mm. matthew perry wow this is when um i think this was around the time when he was on growing pains playing the boyfriend of tracy gold's character um, I forgot about that because yeah, remember that episode? He uh, he was drunk driving. He ends up in the hospital. He seems fine. Then he get a call that he died. I honestly try to forget Growing Pains, given the involvement of one Kirk Cameron, Kirk Cameron, uh, resident okay. crazy asshole Kirk Cameron. I think that's his technical name on Twitter now. <laughs> yeah, tech, tech, that's his that's his Twitter handle. Crazy asshole Kirk. Cameron. No, 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 militant crazy asshole. That's his Twitter handle. Mm, not um, surprising. We're never going to cover his films, are we? I think I've covered something that he was. Oh, yeah. I covered something that he was in at one point, uh, like Father, Like Son. Oh, right. Because we did. you did the body switch months. Earlier this year. Yeah. At the beginning Thank of this year. God I dodged that fucking bullet. That movie wasn't bad, and Kirk Cameron's not bad in it. That's the problem. But it has Dudley Moore and Sean Astin to That's mitigate, the, mitigate the pain. Yeah, but Kirk Cameron's not bad in the movie. That's the problem. Okay, like, well, I, I didn't walk away from that movie going, man, it's a Kirk movie. Cameron's bad. It's a movie I'm surprised Kirk Cameron would be part of because this was right around the time he became a Christian. Praise, um, be. praise be. Well, that's the Church of Perpetual Sorrow, I think. Praise be unto you as well. Praise be unto you. Praise be. Um, John Oliver. Uh, <laughs> praise be. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of surprised he would do that film. Uh, um, maybe he was contractually obligated. Who knows? I have no idea. Um, All I know is it's not bad because he's in it. But he is but not I, a he is not a good person, unfortunately. But I do recommend watching Dance Till Dawn. That's a fun one. Uh, there's a there's a Halloween TV film called Mid- The Midnight Hour, um, released around '84. It has Sherry Belafonte in it. It has Lavar Burton. Um, it has Kurtwood Smith. Uh, do, you fly? do you fly, Bobby? Bitches leave. <laughs> Look, TV movies, as far as yeah. I'm concerned, are a very interesting subtopic within the film world. Because again. You have people that are like, TV movies are movies. And then you have people that are like, what the fuck does it matter? I have, have never really had an opinion. Like, I uh, ostensibly, I grew up watching TV movies. I mean, Xenon, Halloween Town, those are all TV movies. Those are all yeah, Disney produced television yeah. films. And like the network TV films weren't made to people for people to say, you know what? I want to watch that again. They were meant for one off. We've watched the movie. That's a way That's to it. spend a, a, a Sunday night and move on. Yeah, correct. Um, so in my mind, the fact that people are rewatching TV movies 20, 30 years after they come out is mm-hmm. beside the point of why they originally came out. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't change the fact that they're, you know, still movies Not- that people worked on oftentimes have really big names in them. A lot of the TV movies we've covered already this month have. I mean, look, this movie has Sean Bean in it. Sean Bean was making these well after he made Goldeneye. Sean Bean was making these after he made Lord of the Rings. He must have liked this enough to keep working on it for fuck's sake. Like that's God where I come him. at it. That's where I come at it from television movies. Like, yeah. are the people involved giving it their all? Yes. Are the people who wrote it giving it their all? Yes. Are the people who directed it giving it their all? Yes. Then like, why do I need to make the distinction of where it aired? Because you don't. We live in 2021 now. I can watch movies that come out in the theaters on my TV. I'm not going to be that guy who devalues it watching it on my TV versus in the theater because I have someone like Denis Villeneuve to do it for me. Anyway, make an effort and people will watch them. (laughs) Trevor, I'm sorry, but if Denis Villeneuve says my movie is not meant to be watched on a on a phone, it's like, dude, after the movie leaves theaters, you can't control how people are going to watch it, man. Like, to that so, point, to that watch Dune in an airplane flying to Spain. What do you don't want them to watch it because it's not how you wanted them to watch it? Like, I'm sorry. To but. that effect, to that effect, I agree with you. But I do think there are some films that are meant to be seen on the big screen as an experience. But I know you disagree. What does that constitute? What do you mean? What does it constitute? What makes a movie? What necessitates a film needing to be seen on the big screen? The scope. I'm not disagreeing with you. The scope. Um, like I'll see certain trailers and I think to myself, especially lately, I watch a trailer and I think to myself, could I wait until this came to streaming or would a big screen enhance the experience for me? Let me ask you a question though. What if those days are the same? What do you mean? You said, do I have to wait for it to come to streaming? Are you talking like HBO max versus theater? Right. You know what? I've done that a couple times. Um, no, I saw in the Heights. 
on the big screen instead of HBO Max because that film is an epic musical. I want to see the great sound, uh, the 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 theater, big theater. I didn't see it on home stream because I didn't think I'd appreciate it as much. And I still think that when it came to like Space Jam, A New Legacy, I was more than happy to sit on my ass at home and just watch it that way. But what if that's not the way the director intended you watch it? What if he Fuck. wanted you to watch it? But it's almost like you're having it both ways. No, no, no. It's <sighs> it's a complex. It doesn't issue. mean it depends on the film. Of course. Some people want to. Some people don't agree that Dune is big screen or nothing. I don't. I think I would prefer to watch it on the big screen, but that doesn't mean that anyone else is wrong for wanting to watch it at home. And it also doesn't. There is no way, shape, form, or fashion that watching something at home should detract from my enjoyment. I'm talking preference, my personal preference. Sure, and I'm because I've always director opens his mouth and says, "Don't watch my movie at home." It's like, well, dude, I mean, on, I mean, man. like, well, you remember what David Lynch said about the whole watching on your phone thing. Oh, and I know what Scorsese said. And I know what Nolan said. Look, it's nice that you can say these things, but you're also saying them removed. From I think not reality, but from general thinking like, OK, here's the thing. Like when I saw the trailer for Top Gun Maverick, I thought to myself, I have to see that in IMAX because the the it looks like. The, the flying jet sure. are gorgeous looking and just sure. the sound of them flying by would be amazing. You know, and I look at the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer and I think that looks like it's going to be kind of cool. I mean, because, you know, the Marvel films, I try to make an effort to see them in the theater when I can. Yeah. You and Mike. Um, was Mike's Mike's first movie back in theaters was Black Widow. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. And. There are some films, well, there are some films I will see in theaters because I want to support the filmmaker. Um, like when I saw Nine Days, um, this, I showed you, I right, told right, you. Right, 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 right. I thought you were talking about the film with. Uh... Not the Will Smith film. No. Anyway, I wanted to support the filmmaker. And plus I had heard great things. Sure. And I didn't want to wait for it to come to streaming because I didn't know when that would be. And it was playing at my local theater. I have Regal Unlimited, which probably helps make my decision easier. Right. Because if I'm only paying 20 bucks a month to see unlimited films, of course, I'm going to take advantage of that. Sure. I, I get do. it. Like, I'll go see two movies a day. Like the last time when I went, like I saw nine days and before uh, the, uh, the movie I saw before that was free guy. I, you know, and I saw that in 3D because that's one that fit in my schedule. I originally was going to see it in IMAX, but I, the only thing that, that fit with uh, my timing was the 3D, which I didn't hate. The 3D was actually added to the film i thought the 3d was well done um but yeah you know that's i mean that's why i really hope theaters can make it through this pandemic because we need them i need them i like the communal experience of experiencing a film with other people it's 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 kind of like the mentality of when you go see the room or rocky horror in a theater you're enjoying that together but i would say that that theater experience I would still go do that theater experience in 2021. I could give a shit about seeing a big budget movie in a theater with a bunch of other people who are there to see it. If I'm going to see Rocky Horror, Repo the Genetic Opera, or going to see a movie that is not in theaters because it's just coming out, I, it's it, it. you know what, I'll, I'll equate it this way. My wife and I don't grow grocery shopping anymore. We do Instacart. Mm-hmm. Why? Why would I waste my time if someone else is going to get paid to go do the thing I could have done and I can do other things around the house or on the weekend? I mean, yeah. I look at, I, and you know what? If I want to go buy specialty groceries, I'll go to Whole Foods. I'll go to a local farmer's market. But for the most part, going to the grocery store in this day and age, the people who do Instacart are so good at it. Like, you know, you want to make this something that is making you money? I will support you. I will tip you well if you do a good job, which most of the time they do. I look at movie theaters the same way. Can I see most new movies now other ways the same day or within a week of it coming out? Yeah. Uh So why would I go? I I, I know that there is the intangibles. I get it. I, I appreciate it. And frankly, Trevor, I wish I cared as much about that as you do, because the stuff that you're talking about is the stuff that I actively don't care about with the movie experience communal experience, great sound, great visuals. I get it. I I appreciate that. And I understand where you're coming from. Uh But for me at this point, I always found the movie theater experience to be (sighs) 
good at best, fucking obnoxious at worst. And 90% of the time, Father Malone will talk about this. Most movie theater chains could give a shit about the way they screen a movie, the sound, the audio. They don't care about tuning it to make it sound good, which is fine. I get unless it. Unless you're a, a cult chain like the Alamo Draft House. Which has its own problems, like, you know, sexually harassing their employees and stuff like that. And going bankrupt. Did they go bankrupt or are they closed? Uh, a lot of bad things happened to them. I'm uh, not too disappointed. Um, okay. But I, I, unlike grocery shopping, there is part of me that would agree with you that there are certain movies I would, like, I would love to go see Indiana Jones 5 in theaters. Mm-hmm. But that's because I personally didn't get to see my favorite Indiana Jones movie in theaters when it came out. I yeah. wasn't born yet. Indiana mm-hmm. Jones and the Temple of Doom. I saw Kingdom of the Crystal Skull in theaters like I bet you did. And I bet you twice. Th- I saw it twice the day it came out. I went and saw it at midnight and then I went and saw it in the afternoon after class. It yeah, but sucked, I'm one of the sucked both times. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those guys who doesn't have the vitriolic hate for a crystal skull. It's not a terribly good movie. No, but I don't I, have the. But I, I don't care enough to hate it like other people do. You don't think Lucas and Spielberg took Indiana Jones out back and beat up your childhood? No, I don't think that South Park episode had any bearing on how I felt about the. I think it's more of a condemnation of the I people think, who think that way and less of the less of Spielberg and Lucas. Here's what I think. I think the ones bitching about him surviving a nuclear explosion in a fridge, but somehow failed to mention that just closing your eyes prevents the Ark of the Covenant from destroying you. Come on, you gotta, you gotta, you can't pick and choose your believability battles when it comes to an Indiana Jones film. When it comes to a film series inspired by pulp serials of the 1930s yeah, and 40s, you, you can't pick and choose your battles. You either, you either accept that this is going to be ridiculous at times, or just be an unhappy little asshole. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's how I, I feel. I, I agree with you. I agree with. I, I will tell you, I don't like Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, not because of the refrigerator thing. I just think it's a very dumb movie that I, I, it does does nothing well, especially not give me a reason to care about what Indiana Jones has been up to since Last Crusade. When I go to an Indiana Jones film. And I did go to a marathon, by the way, one time where they showed we left before Crystal Skull, but we watched the first three. That's not um, like Crystal Skull too much then, Trevor. Well, my friend, my friend who was my only ride there. This is the guy I talked to you about for the podcast. Started. was like, I'm going to leave you, motherfucker, if you don't come with me. Basically. Um, I mean, but yeah, I mean, it was a joy, an absolute joy to experience those films on the big screen, because when those films came out, the first one came out, what, 81 or 80? Yeah. I was like a top. I was like yeah. barely walking. Yeah. Um, I might have seen Last Crusade at the drive-in. Um, Temple of Doom was like when I was like four or five. So yeah, I was kind of too little. Been, to- you would have been old enough to see Last Crusade. It's the same thing with the Ghostbusters films, a film series I adore. Even the second one, don't come at me. I like the um, second one. Don't look at me like that. Um, well, I'm talking I def- about I defend that. I defend that second one. I love. I do one. too. I thought the second one was. I'll get to it in a minute. But are you going to say the second one's better than the first one? Oh no, 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 no. Um, the first one I was four when it came out. Eighty four was a great year for movies. Let's just get that out of the way. It's true. And I was too young. For, but when they re released the film uh, for its anniversary with a new digital print and you know, Dolby Atmos sound me and my friend Jeff went and I loved it, man. I fucking loved going to see it. Here's what I'm talking about. What you are talking about. I'm all for man. I mm-hmm. went and watched newsies in the theater like four years ago. Like, you know, I, I never We're, saw that in theaters. Like I love going and seeing movies that I love in theaters. Well, we have a theater here called the central cinema. It's not like a huge screen or anything. Sure. It's it's one of those restaurant. It's one of those theaters where you can order food at your table and they'll serve over to even the popcorn and they make. Is and, it is it have but is it have house made clarified butter on the popcorn? I have no fucking clue, but they show <laughs> the answer is probably yes. They show um they show older films. Yeah, they're like the draft like, house, um, right? Like like kind of like the draft house. I mean, like and once a month they do a showing of the room and and the last time they showed it, Greg Sestero was here. And I missed it and I hate myself for it. Um, But that's a theater I enjoy going to because I get to watch my, you know, favorite films on the big screen, on a big screen. Um, One of my favorite theatrical experiences 
Do you know how much of a Back to the Future nerd I am? Do yes, you? I can okay. see your fucking time travel thing over your shoulder. <laughs> oh, my flux, my flux capacitor. Flux capacitor. Oh, I, you haven't even seen the other things. What do you um, do? You have a, a hoverboard? Actually, yes, I do. I have a plush one and a and a replica one I bought from HalloweenCostumes.com for fifty bucks, and it was the best investment I ever made. Maybe they're just not as quotable and memorable as they were in the past. There's not the fandom. I don't know. I like, mean, go- people have had their fandom beaten out of them because nobody's fandom can be fun anymore. The internet ruined fandom. Let's just yes. say it. Yeah, I mean, the internet ruined it, it, a lot of it, things. The internet brought us together as fans, but it also ruined us as fans. Because it pitted us against each other in this I'm right, you're wrong battle of of the the nerds, I guess you could say it. It's a pissing contest where no one wins. Exactly. And it and it's fucking annoying because as a 41-year-old man who just gets absolute joy from going to a theater, it doesn't bring me the joy that it used to when I was growing up. Like when I was in when I like even through high school, going to the movies was like an event for me, an right. experience. Now it feels like something I can do whenever, but I still enjoy going. And like when you're growing up, when you go to the movies, it's, it's a special occasion. It feels like, because it's not something you do every day. I mean, it must be really, you know, going to see this movie, like, um, even going to the transactional now. Exactly. And like when I was living in Oak Harbor back in the late eighties, we used to go to the, the blue Fox drive-in all the, all the time. And that was also an event for me because even though the double feature, the first feature was always the one meant for the family or the kids. And then the second feature would be one for more of the, the parents. And I would usually fall asleep during the second movie because, you know, um, like I remember the first film we saw there was Willow and Arthur two on the rocks. That was the double feature playing there. And I wanted, you know, and that's where I saw Willow for the first time. And that's where I fell asleep watching Arthur two. <laughs> I mean, whenever, and it was weird because anytime Roger Rabbit played there, we went and saw it. We would go, no matter what, what the second feature was. Oh, really? And, yeah. And I and I loved going to the drive-in. And I think the drive-in still has a bit of magic to it. It still has a, it, it still has an appeal. I mean, if anything, COVID has shown us that drive-ins are almost the optimal way to watch movies. Because <laughs> Well, one, you're still seeing it on a big screen. Two, you can talk as loud as you fucking want. And three, you're in the safety and comfort of your own car. And you can listen to the film as loud as you want or as quiet as you want. Right. Or you in can fact, literally you can turn... just fucking sleep the entire time. Yeah, which means you paid to watch. No. Last time I went to a drive-in, uh, me and my friend Newman, we went and saw Ghost Protocol, the Mission Impossible, the one before Fallout. Sure. Um, I wish we had stayed for the second film, but I forgot what that second film was. Um, but yeah, drive-ins, I really hope they make a comeback because of COVID. Because there have. is, there's an appeal. You can show classic films there, and people will still go see it. Yeah, because people, there are people who will still pay to watch childhood favorites on the big screen. Like you were agreeing with me on that. You would I, say I, you I, did the same thing. That's for me. That's the only kind of movies I really want to go see in theaters are the movies that I already love that I had never that I didn't get the opportunity to see. Like like Ghostbusters, Caddyshack. Fuck, I would pay. Anything to be able to see Fletch on the big screen. I fucking love that movie. Or Freaked. I know that they did a showing of Freaked in the last year. I was and a half. I was just gonna say that. It's like yeah. you and I both know that if we found out Freak was gonna play at our local theater, our ass would be in the seats immediately. I tried to get Freaked to play at the local Alamo Draft House, and that's why I don't like the Alamo Draft House, is because the guy who worked there treated me like garbage and essentially burned all of my bridges with all the folks that I talked to for the most part on freaked. I love, like, I love going to the movies. I just don't like what sitting in a movie theater represents anymore. I think what, like the reason I think we would love seeing older films on the big screen is we know that the people who go to those films are there for those films. Exactly. Because they love those films and aren't there to wonder what, Hey, I wonder if this is going to be any good. You know, they're there no, because it's the it's almost it almost falls solely on the shoulders of the audience at this point. Exactly. The commoditization of films, film watching has really killed my interest in the film industry, at least from a participation in the act of going to a theater. It doesn't feel exciting anymore. No, most things don't feel exciting anymore, Trevor, to be perfectly honest with you. The joy You're and right. fun has been drained out of almost everything. 
it, it's breaks, true. Like, it breaks my heart. It breaks your breaks heart. heart. I, I don't. I don't get to enjoy things the way I used to anymore because we're told we're not allowed to enjoy them or here's why you shouldn't enjoy it or this is why this is problematic and I get caught doing it as much as everyone else but oh it is exhausting the th- like I was I was watching uh this um Ghostbusters news YouTube channel and this guy just everything Ghostbusters related he has news on he he talks about and he was showing off the new line of Ghostbusters Afterlife toys for kids you know just for kids and, you know, they have a, a proton pack, um, two different versions of the of the of the the streamer gun. You have to buy them separately. They don't come together, which because because they're greedy. Um, <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, man, if I was nine years old and this had come out when Ghostbusters 2 came out, I would lose my fucking mind. Yeah. Like that would be the only thing I would want for Christmas that year was that proton pack. And people are in the comment section like. Oh, it's too small. It doesn't have a back. You know, like, and even the person in the video mentioned, remember, these are for kids. And that distinction is important in 2021 because Mattel makes stuff for adults. Well, Hasbro and, does. Hasbro does, too. Well, I know. But like what? Yeah. But yeah, Mattel, Hasbro, all the big toy makers are now mm-hmm. making things for like even like it took Lego. God knows how long for them to realize that. Yes, adults put Legos together, and maybe you should make a product line for adults. And they have. There are literally, I have a George Harrison picture on my wall that's made out of Legos. That's four adults. No child would be putting together a picture of one of the four Beatles, whichever one you choose. And yeah, I think, again, to your point, people let themselves get in the way of stuff, especially enjoyment, because, Mm -hmm. oh, it's not made, like, just because something's not made for you does not, or... Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that was made for you. But I do appreciate that companies like Hasbro and Mattel are realizing they have an adult fan base and want to, you know, show adults that it's okay to collect this kind of stuff. Yeah, like you're not a big, fat, sweaty nerd if you buy a fucking adult replica proton pack. You're not a fucking loser. You're a collector. Move on. Thank you for making me feel better about that purchase. Um, Because Hasbro... Trevor, I built my own Ghostbusters outfit from scratch, dude. Like, I, I was lazy and I bought I bought the costume. Um, but when Hasbro released their Egon Spengler Ghostbusters Afterlife replica proton neutrono wand, 150 bucks, you know I pre-ordered that motherfucker and I yeah. love it. And it's it's sitting on it's sitting on uh my one of my video cabinets and it just looks absolutely beautiful. I sometimes take it down and play with it because it has it has different um sound effects like you can even do the sound effect of the slime blower from Ghostbusters 2. And who is And that? I love it. Who is that for? Me. It's for that yeah, exactly. That's and for like, me. The guy who the guy who loves Ghostbusters 1 and 2, who loves yeah. Ghostbusters and who always wanted a life-size replica of the straight the thing to shoot, you know, pretend ghosts with. Yeah. And um in October 2022, Hasbro is releasing a Nerf gun shaped like the Pulse Blaster I know, from I Aliens. Saw, I know, I saw. I know, I saw. I and know, I am saw. I and Did I have to ask you this. Um, unfortunately, my debit card is about to expire in September. So when my new card gets here, that's the first thing I'm doing is pre-ordering that thing. I because want to pre-order it and then paint it like paint it like the blaster in the film. Yeah, I don't want it to look like a Nerf gun. What fun is that? <sighs> I'd be too afraid. To, but I love I love the care they but I love the care they've put into it. It's not like a typical Nerf gun. This thing has like electronics. It has sound effects from the film. And in my head, I'm like, oh my God, I want this so fucking bad. And who is that for? It's not for kids. Like, No, it's for us. What yeah. kids are watching Aliens? I, hey, I don't know. I mean, there might be kids. I, I don't know okay, if they're no, not. No, 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 no. Let's, don't be that guy. But I think, but the, the, I think the majority thinking is adults. Here's, who, here's, here's a better or way to argue it. What is okay. the price point? 90 it's about almost with tax it's 104 bucks yeah what kid can afford that uh a kid with a very rich parent but i'm ordering it i think a kid with a very rich parent is going to be worrying about a pulse rifle from a 80s movie there is something to be said for adult collectibles adult collectibles you know the movie i mean this is all kind of the same thing like we're talking about the movie theater experience and i am railing against going to the movies to see new movies but i Mm -hmm. am appreciative and accepting of the idea of going to the movies to see fuck aliens, something like that. Like 
But that, but who is that for? Like you said, that's for people who are that's fans. for the fans. Yeah, it's for the fans of these things. And that for me is what's more important than just going and seeing the new movies is participating in something with people that at least for all intents and purposes are there to see something that they also love. And I want this trend to continue where studios at times re-release for anniversaries. Like I love what Fathom events does, you know, Fathom events will re-release uh, like they just did a, a special re-release of the, the great Muppet caper. Mm-hmm. I wish I could have seen it, but that's a great film. I love the Muppet movies. Um, like when they re-released Sandlot for the anniversary, of course I went and saw it. And I was just, I was a kid all over again, sure. loving every scene of it, wearing my, I was wearing my, you're killing me smalls t-shirt at the film. And I'm sure you were not the only one. No. And you know, it's, but that's my point. Like you, you like going to those midnight showings was where you went for that. Right. Like, and they don't even do those anymore. Like they would do midnight premieres of big budget films. They don't even do that anymore. Well, I mean, Trevor, no one's going to the theaters anyways. Why are they going to do anything at midnight? Well, even before the pandemic, they weren't. Doing oh, I know they, they like got, I mean, they got rid of that. I remember that was a thing in high school. Like I was saying, I went and saw Indiana Jones. I saw pineapple express at midnight. Like what the fuck? I saw that at comic-con. Who the fuck is going to go see pineapple express at midnight? I did. And I passed out in the movie. <laughs> humble, humble, humble brag. I saw that at comic-con and met Judd, Ap- Judd Apatow. So humble brag. I like I would go to midnight screenings at the Cinerama in uh, Seattle before they closed. And I saw like Spider-Man 2, the original, the Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man 2. I saw 300 at midnight. I saw Iron Man at midnight. I saw, okay, what else did I see there at midnight? I saw a bunch of films. I saw Tron Legacy at midnight there. And that is a fun experience, man, because. Yeah, Cinerama Dome, right? It's not a dome. It's it's just Cinerama. Oh, it's, not, it's not the dome one. No, that the dome is in uh, Instant California. But I don't even know if that's in there more. Um, uh, if not Tarantino's by you would go there and people would be dressed up as the characters for films. They don't even know if they like yet. Like when I went and saw Tron legacy, there was a couple dressed in Tron outfits before the, you know, before the movie had even started. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, pe- people like to make fun of people who are super fans of shit, but like they drive all of this. No, 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 you're fine. I'd like to say that if movies are your religion, that's your midnight mass, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Going to the movie theaters is, is your weekly religion. The, yeah, it, it is. I mean, if, and you're all congregating together yeah. for a similar purpose. Yeah. Um, and Cinerama, God bless them, would do what they call 70 millimeter film festivals and where they would show films that were filmed in 70 millimeter and show them in 70 millimeter. Like, but the 2001 a space odysseys were always sold out. So I never got to see those. They had, they played aliens in 70 millimeter. Um, the films I saw in 70 millimeter were um, the dark crystal, which looked, gorgeous in 70 millimeter and the print was pristine tron the original tron in 70 millimeter which also looked amazing and the original ghostbusters which uh, that print had seen better days because the film kept kind of the skipping and cutting dialogue out you know you could tell what see when you know the film as well as i do you you know which parts are getting cut and uh one year um i bought tickets to see et and howard the duck and I was on my way to see E.T. and the Uber I was in got in a wreck. So I missed that one. But I was still able to see Howard the Duck that day. And I loved watching Howard the Duck on the big screen. It's we've talked about this, haven't we? How much I like Howard the Duck. No, but I'm not surprised. Not because because it just seems like something you would like. And you know what movie they showed the next year for the 70 millimeter film festival? Battlefield Earth. Yeah, figures. And I, I would have paid to see that just to. Just to just laugh at that fucking thing at in seventy millimeter. Howard the Duck is a bad movie, but it is a interesting bad movie. The music kicks ass, though. I mean, it's got duck tits. Woohoo! I, I, I mean, duck tits are a choice. George Lucas made a choice. I mean, a real choice. And it was still PG. I know. Well, duck this tits is aren't, duck tits. Are wait a minute, hold on. When was PG thirteen? Was that eighty four, eighty five? When they whenever when Temple they, of Doom came out. I thought, yeah, but because I think Poltergeist was like gonna be R. But Steven Spielberg had enough pull in Hollywood to get them to change it to PG. And uh, that movie has two people smoking grass in it. <laughs> that movie would be PG 13 today. Yeah, well, it was when it came out. Um, no, it was PG when it came out. No, when it came out, the new one was PG. Oh, what'd you think of that, by the way? It was. If you want to hear my thoughts, go listen to Mark Begley's Wake Up Heavy podcast, where we talk about all four Poltergeist movies. Oh, uh, that's a sad. The third one has a sad story. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, they all kind of have a sad 
Uh, Sorry. Heather O'Rourke dying is sad, and she's in uh, three. Don't forget the sister from the first one. I didn't. Uh, but I don't want to bring that up because that case is even more awful. Yeah. Um, Trevor. Yes. Sharp's rifle. Mm-hmm. It's good. Yes. Not necessarily pushes you in the direction of seeing the next one. No. But I think we can both agree. Mm-hmm. Sean Bean is Best amazing the- in this. Yes, he is. And if you like Sean Bean, you should watch this. Absolutely. Because Sean Bean, again, guy doesn't get a whole lot of leading roles. He's a great character actor. He's a great supporting actor. He's uh-huh. a great villain. But he he is just not given the leading roles as much as he should be, which means anytime he's in a leading role, I kind of want to see more of it. So, yeah. so Sharp's Rifle, skip it or watch it, Trevor. Uh, I say watch it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I, I would you won't. Yeah. You, you'll. It's, you it's could a, do worse. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, it, in a in hundred minutes, a lot happens that it'll keep your interest for that hundred minutes. Yeah. I, I think that that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost too full to the point where it needs another 20 minutes. Yeah. Which is not, of all the things that could be problematic with the movie, that's the least of them. Like, oh, it needs some more time. Like, okay. Okay. Could be worse. So. Yeah. Could be a lot worse. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to advocate watching it as well. It's a good one. And yeah, like I think it's all on YouTube or it can be found easily because I think you can buy it on Amazon. But on that note, let's take a break and we'll play a preview for the final podcast of TV Movie Month. Los Angeles, 2007. Harry Wyckoff is an ambitious attorney. Everybody knows you're making partner. Who has it all. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me, Grace. But Harry wants more. How would you like to work for me at five times your old salary? Greed is about to trap him. You're with us now. Between good and evil. We're talking two groups. Political enemies. The defenders of freedom. One day you're going to find out that our country no longer belongs to us. And their oppressors. Senator Tony Kreitzer. A corrupt elite. We are the cardinals of this cathedral. Beaming virtual reality into homes around the world. He is our Alexander and he will conquer the countries of our imaginations one by one. And we will dream him into infinity. And using it to seize power through intimidation. This better be good. I'm gonna do some cutting now, okay? Seduction. Pull him in. Show him. The wild blue sky. I want you to touch me. And mind control. I have seen the future. It's just me. For Harry Wyckoff, the nightmare has just begun. I think you do things you can't imagine. Who's dangerous? Ah! My eyes! There's more than one reality. The marriage was arranged, Harry. They have taken my baby and given me the son of another. Did you think there wasn't a price to pay? I don't like being ambushed, Paige. I'm not gonna let them hurt you. It betrays you with every breath. You don't know what you're up against. Oliver Stone, the director of theatrical and home video hits Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK, brings to home video the entertainment event of the year, Wild Palms. That's right. On t- the final podcast of TV Movie Month, we're going to be taking a look at Wild Palms, which is actually a television miniseries. It is split into three parts. We're going to be covering all three parts. Who is going to be joining me, you ask? My good friend, host of the Scary Stories We Tell podcast, the always fantastic Jess Byard. Until then, Trevor, if people wanted to find you on the internet, where would they look? Well, you can find me, as always, on the On Seagal podcast at onsegal.com. You can find me on Twitter at Bad Vertigo and on Instagram at Mad Vertigo because I have no originality whatsoever. Uh, and that's it. And as for me, you can find me at cstashy.com. That's my link tree. That's where all the podcasts I work on go. Like Trevor mentioned, him and I host a podcast once a month called the On Seagal podcast where we take a look at Steven Seagal movies. If you're not a fan of Steven Seagal, but you've always been interested in what Steven Seagal is all about, Our podcast is the bad place to start. 
Uh, along with that, I have a bunch of other podcasts that I work on, so that's where you can find that. Culturecast.com is where you can find this podcast. Patreon.com slash Culturecast is where you can go to support us on Patreon. Your support's welcomed, but not necessary. And as always, Trevor, thank you for joining me. Thank you. 